when missiles like this were flying in the 1950s, models like this hit the hobby shops. But were they successful? We're about to find out in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. If you went to the hobby shop in the late 1950s, it was mostly airplanes. Uh, there were rocket-powered research aircraft, but then there were rockets. The age of the missile uh, was upon us. It was the Cold War, and you had uh, the Army Corporal, uh, the Army Nike Hercules, and the V-2 uh, from World War II at White Sands, New Mexico. So it uh, stood to reason that you'd have the uh, model of the Corporal, a model of the Nike Hercules, and Oh, the Redstone, which was an outgrowth. It was a V2 with a Rocketdyne engine. And these were the missile kits all released in the uh, 1957 to 1959 timeframe. The wing missiles seemed to do well. You had the Regulus, uh, which was one of the first cruise missiles uh, shown here being launched uh, on a test at Edwards Air Force Base. You had the Snark, which was uh, mounted on a mobile launcher for the Air Force. And you had the Mason Matador, uh, which were actually deployed uh, in Europe uh, in the early years of NATO. The model companies uh, went to great lengths to educate us model builders on the wonders of missiles and rocketry. Um, Monogram had Willie Lay, the uh, expert uh, with their kits. Gravel had this booklet you could get. Uh, it was really a, a concerted effort to uh, educate uh, our generation in uh, all the things that uh, were involved in ICBMs and anti-aircraft missiles and things of that nature. So let's start with the SNARK. Uh, the SM-62 built by Northrop, uh, powered by a J-75 Pratt & Whitney uh, turbojet, just like a F-105 or F-106. And uh, you see the warhead portion of the missile is uh, ahead of the white stripe that you see there at the wing leading edge. Uh, and this was a long range cruise missile uh, boosted into uh, flight with solid rocket boosters that would drop away and then uh, powered to the target by the, uh, by the jet. Uh, this was a Mach 2 aircraft. But the early test versions were painted red with uh, white stripes, as you see here. And uh, that was the, uh, the kit that was released by Ravel and also Monogram, which you'll see in a moment. Um, I thought I'd show you what the uh, painting looks like by itself before it becomes box art. Here you notice the artist paints plenty of background area and then the art directors uh, with the layout, layout folks and uh, actually design the, the box top. So let's take a moment and look at the uh, altitude of the SNARK at launch plus one second. Look at the height from the bottom of the missile to the launcher. Or here's another view uh, and notice that uh, it's, it's well up in the air at this point. It's uh, the, the JATO uh, boosters have just uh, ignited, and this thing has really taken off. So let's look at the model. Well, wait a minute. I remember seeing this in the store and, and thinking, gosh, this thing's going to just fall on the ground. I guess the booster didn't, didn't ignite the way they're supposed to, or something was wrong. But what, what you're seeing here is how the artist uh, designs the composition to fit into the standard size Revell 79 cent box. Another type of missile was the ground to air anti-aircraft. Uh, in the uh, heat of the Cold War, this was a major uh, weapon for US defenses. Uh, there was always concern that uh, enemy bombers would be coming in over the North Pole uh, for a nuclear strike. And so the Nike system uh, was developed. And this is the Ajax, the original model with uh, a liquid fuel booster. And here you have the Nike Hercules uh, which really became the, the backbone of the anti-aircraft uh, defense forces uh, with uh, solid uh, rocket boosters and uh, much more advanced uh, nuclear-tipped uh, 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 second stage. Uh, it's an amazing fact that 25,000 Nike Hercules were produced, uh, designed by Douglas and built by a number of different contractors. So, Let's talk about the Nike Hercules for a moment and then we'll look at the models. This is Republic Aviation in Farmingdale, a defense plant on Long Island along with Grumman and a couple of Air Force bases. And so it was a, a defense asset uh, that needed protection uh, in the Cold War. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, you'll notice a little 
stripe up there. And that is a runway of a small airport right across the uh, Southern State Parkway from Republic called Zons. Now I'm showing you this because right in the center of the photo is a peaked roof hangar uh, with a tall chimney. And this was the Army National Guard, which was located at Zons, which was a little general aviation airport with a flight school. And I always thought to myself, what's the Army National Guard doing at our airport? This is where I took my first flying lessons. Well, what's happening is um, just above the wingtip there of the Cherokee uh, is a, a convent and a nunnery. And across the street from that was a Nike station, New York 24. Uh, it was in the middle of a residential area, right in the middle of the woods. There was a school nearby, a rec center, and nobody knew that underground were 12 nuclear-tipped Nike Hercules with four launching uh, uh, pads, and uh, this is what was left. I uh, took a trip to New York in 2005 with my friend Tony Accurso, and we made it a point to find this uh, Nike site, and there it was, uh, converted into a, uh, a, Navy, a Navy facility, but the launchers were still there. There were trucks parked on top of the, uh, the launch uh, pads and the uh, missile bay doors. And it was pretty well intact. This was there to protect Republic. Uh, we visited the uh, American Air Power Museum and uh, you notice the uh, 3rd Missile Battalion, 51st Artillery, Battery D uh, was the unit that uh, controlled these Nike Hercules. And here's a missile, ironically, it's on display at Republic Airport. But uh, this, this is one of the Hercules that was uh, at that site. Out on the West Coast, uh, you, they were tested and uh, used for atmospheric tests as well. Uh, but this is a beautiful photo that shows the launch complex. You see the missile bay door in the center and then the four separate uh, pads. Uh, the missiles would uh, be stored underground as you see here and then they'd be raised up on an elevator and moved on those rails into the uh, launch position. On a flight home uh, from Santa Barbara, uh, I took a picture out of a Cessna 172 uh, that was uh, flying through the VFR corridor above uh, LAX. And you notice an unusual pattern just above the wheel pant. And that is LA-70. That's a huge Nike site uh, that was uh, guarding the defense uh, plants at the, at the airport. Here's another view, and uh, this is a, a picture. I was actually taking a photo of this uh, condo because that is the first place that my wife and I moved into after we were married. Sherry worked in the San Fernando Valley. I worked at Douglas and Long Beach, and the halfway point was LAX. So I was taking off on a trip, and I was sitting on the right side of the airplane, just happened to take a picture of the condo, not realizing that I was looking down at LA-70. This site today is called Jet Pets. This is a facility that prepares large animals uh, for air transport uh, by air freight. And uh, it's still there to this day on Pershing Drive, west of the airport. But this is what it looked like originally. Uh, you had the uh, administration and housing uh, facilities up at the upper left, um, the uh, missile assembly building that you see there, the launch complex with the uh, missile bay doors and the four launchers. And the propellant buildings were out of frame and to the right uh, at that time period. But to give you an idea of the size of this complex, this is incredible. Uh, New York, uh, the New York facility was uh, four pads uh, there on Long Island. This is two banks of 12 each for 24 launchers times two missiles underground. That's 48 missiles. That's a lot of asset. Uh, to protect the Douglas, North American, and Northrop plants that were on the southern uh, perimeter of LAX. Uh, this site has, these photos I should mention were taken in 1981, uh, and this site is now plowed under and is uh, part of Westchester Parkway, which was built uh, probably about five years later. So let's look at some Nike models. First one released was by Renwall, part of their uh, fabulous Blueprint series, and this was the Nike Ajax. Um, it's always interesting. You'll see these crewmen in every single model box top and they're either yelling or running or both. Uh, but I think you had to be qualified to, to run the four minute mile to, to uh, uh, be qualified to be a missile crew member. And don't forget to set those launch controls. Uh, the Renwall kits were fabulous. Uh, they had a, a system called the no-show uh, gluing, which uh, was indicated on the model 
direction sheet by the dark black line that you see there. And it showed you precisely where to put the glue and where not to put the glue. And uh, this built up into a quite a nice uh, kit. The missile slid sideways on the rails and then uh, uh, was uh, lifted into the launch position. A year later, uh, Ravel came out with the Nike Hercules. A number of other uh, companies produced the Hercules also, but far and away, Ravel's was the best kit. Uh, here's a buildup. It was just a beautiful model. Uh, it was just like having the real missile shrunk down and uh, uh, put on your dresser in your bedroom after you built it. The hydraulic arms operated, and it was just uh, just tremendous. It had the three crew members. And then there was this uh, Kusan model kit. Actually, it was originally Kusan model trains. But they made a Mongo model of the Nike Hercules. This thing was 22 inches long, not very detailed, but uh, uh, just a, a, an acre of plastic, as I called it. And uh, oh my gosh, who's this kid? Yeah, that's me. I was on my way to the sixth grade science fair where I gave a presentation on multi stage rockets. Yeah, someday I'd be doing uh, programs on YouTube. But um, Anyway, that, that uh, uh, KMT kid gave me a, a nice uh, A plus on my project. So I have to, uh, have to be thankful. A different type of missile, uh, the, the artillery type uh, uh, ground to air uh, was the uh, Northrop Raytheon Hawk. And Ravel did a beautiful kit of that. Uh, and then there was an Adams kit. Steve Adams was a Ravel employee who uh, left the company, started his own uh, operation and bought some of the Ravel molds and two of those were missiles. So you had the uh, Hawk battery as you see here. And then there was this, the Douglas Honest John, which was a truck mounted mobile uh, launcher. And uh, this was Ravel's kit. And here was the Adams kit, same model. Then you had the uh, Corporal, which you saw earlier on its mobile launcher. And there's Ravel's model. This was really a, a, a nice kit, but it was simple. It was two missile halves, the fins and the launcher and the radar uh, truck, some crew figures, and that was it. And then there was this, the Aerobi High, uh, which was a small uh, trailer mounted uh, research rocket. And uh, I, I'm, it was interesting, but I never understood this part of the cover. You've got the guy in the hazmat suit. He's already turning green, it looks like, and he's got the gloves. And then there's the other guy. I guess the wind was blowing from the right. I don't know. And I'm not trying to make fun of this. I don't mean anything disrespectful. It's just what's going on here, you know? Uh, another beautiful model and quite large was the... Uh, Martin Matador uh, by Renwall. This had the Terra Cruiser with the Mace missile. Uh, and uh, it was the fully operating model, had the no-show cementing direction sheet. Uh, the Mace and the Matador were essentially the same airframe, different warheads. Uh, but uh, another Renwall blueprint model, and uh, this thing was huge. Um, the Bomark, uh, this was a, a, an anti-aircraft missile uh, ramjet powered and uh, quite an interesting design. It was built by Boeing and uh, Ravel had a stunning model. This is really an outstanding kit. The Bomark, by the way, was a contraction for uh, Boeing and the Michigan Aerospace Research Center. And then uh, finally you had the Regulus. Uh, the Regulus II was a supersonic uh, uh, shipboard missile, could be launched uh, from a submarine or aircraft carrier. And it was a, uh, an advancement of the Regulus I, which was a subsonic design seen here on the deck of a carrier and also able to be launched by submarine. These were the first cruise missiles uh, powered by J-79 General Electric engine, same as, uh, as the F-4 Phantom or the F-104. And uh, the three missiles that you see here were test uh, designs, test prototypes that were equipped with landing gear so they could be recovered uh, like, a, like a drone and then uh, reused again, saving uh, taxpayer money. To give you an idea of how prolific uh, these models were, every manufacturer seemed to be building them. You had Aurora, you had Comet, you had Ravel, Monogram with the launcher, Everybody, uh, all the model companies seem to be in the uh, missile business there for a while. But 
far and away winner of the best uh, reg regulus two uh, box art was Jack Lenwood's depiction of the missile taking off at sunset. Nobody could paint a regulus two like Jack. Le Wait a minute, what's going on here? The landing gear has wires and it's just lifting off. How are they gonna retract the gear? Well, on the real missile, the nose gear retracted forward, the main gear retracted rearward, and you had uh, safety wires that prevented uh, inadvertent gear retraction on the ground. And Jack, always wanting to attract our attention, left them in his rendering, and there they are. By the way, if you'd like a book about these missiles, uh, our specialty press offer uh, is the uh, Complete History of U.S. Cruise Missiles by Bill Yenny really super book. It's nine by nine softbound and tells you everything you'd ever want to know about the Matador, Mace, Regulus, Navajo, and Snark. And by the way, Snark is a, a contraction of the words snake and shark. I had to say that slowly. But uh, this is a terrific book. Uh, you click on the link just below the uh, title block and you get a 25% discount. The book's delivered right to your door. So what happened with all these kits? Well, you, there was a plethora of missile models and I didn't even show things like the, uh, the Atlas and the Mercury Atlas and so on, but uh, this is a good representation. And what happened? The winged missiles seemed to sell well. They were more like the airplanes for some reason and they had more appeal. The uh, regular missiles did not sell well at that time. Most of these were never re-released or reissued. Uh, they were just one pressing and that was it. But ironically, in today's market, or I should say at the peak of the collectible market in the 1990s, these missile kits became the most coveted, uh, rarest, and sometimes highest priced kits of any uh, of, all, of the collectible kits. And uh, it all came full circle. So there you have it, the story of missiles and kits in the 1950s. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. As always, special thanks to uh, the folks that made this possible, Craig Cadera, uh, my friend Tony Curso, and the Wings and Air Power Historical Archive. Until next time, take care.